Welcome to Paranormal UK Radio with your hosts, Irene Allen Block and Mark Johnson. Welcome back to Paranormal UK Radio, broadcasting to you on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host, Irene Allen Block, and with me tonight is my co-host, Mark Johnson. Are you, are you sure that's my name? Yes, is, is, got it is, right this is, time. Is that me? Are we sure? Yes. Okay, just, want, just wanted to be sure this time. Okay, all right then. I think it's your name, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry, listeners. Last time on the last show, I forgot Mark's surname. That's what he's having a dig about. Yes, I know, and I'm so enjoying giving that dig too. Yeah, I know you are. You're going to keep that on me for life, aren't you? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I know. No mercy, no mercy. So no we, mercy, you know, no we, mercy. Okay. It, uh, we both had holidays in our prospective countries. You there in the UK, me here in the US. How was your lovely holiday weekend? How was it? Well, I climbed a mountain with four kiddies, all under 11 years old. I dragged them up the mountain and I went into three cave systems. Not bad, eh? You, you scrambling around caves... That that would have been uh, worth some pictures. Yeah, up in the Breckens. I was I was up in the Breckens, up in the Breckens in Wales, and apparently this cave system uh, was found back in the early part of last century by two farmers. Yeah, two farmers, two brothers, and they found a slit in the side of the cave, um, the hill. And they could just squeeze through it. And when they squeezed through it, what they saw inside was absolutely fantastic. And, of course, we went and saw it this weekend. Now, again, so you, showed me the, you showed me the picture that you took in there of the waterfall inside the cave. And uh, yeah. turns out there was a little more in that picture than you originally thought. Well, yeah, there was. There was a, I don't know what to call it. Well, I really don't know what to call it. Is it a little person? Is it Paradoria? What is it? Come on, you tell me. Yeah, you know what? That's, it's one of those things that it's hard to tell you because I don't know. Um, since there's, there's some light reflections, um, from, there's an off-camera light source. You did use a flash with the camera. But yeah. it's not just looking at orbs or spots because there are orbs, but that's the water vapor coming up from the cloud forming orbs no yeah. there's there's looks like a, a two foot tall figure at the very bottom standing there you it looks like a woman with her face and you see her hands no i thought it was a monk i really thought it was a monk well you think everything you say it's a woman and to me it looks like a monk yeah but i'm the uh the um the photo analyst, all right. and I say it's yeah, a woman. Yeah, yeah, all right. You'll say it's a woman. Yes. Okay, it's a woman. <laughs> okay, deal with it. <laughs> I will, I will. Okay. Okay. But no fascinating photo. I mean, we can we say it's paranormal? No. But at yeah. the same time, with your track record of taking, you know, family photos when you go out for the day with, with the kids, <laughs> last time you went to Clan Stefan Castle and came back with about, I think, four apparitions, I, I yeah, think that was pretty true. impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they seem to be attracted to me in one way or the other. But this is a funny, strange little person who's down near the waterfall, and you can see the, the head and the hands and one thing. Like that. Anyway, listeners, if you want to see this photograph, go to... Mark? Go to our Facebook page on... No, www.sallyinstitute.com. SARinstitute.com. Yes, it's there. It's also on our Facebook group page, too, So, which is what I was mm. going to say before you rudely interrupted me. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that that's really interesting. In fact, um, for me, I'm very interested in the whole anything doing with caves and mines. I mean, some of the things we've been researching over the last couple of years... Um, that what seems to be in a lot of these caves and mines, and I think this is uh, if the picture shows paranormal activity, I think it's uh, proof towards that theory. Yeah, and what? Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I really don't know. But what have we got coming up soon with Sari? We've got 
a gold mine. Well, uh, going to be doing a gold mine. Yeah, it's something I'm going to be setting up. Uh, there's a gold mine up in Idaho Springs. I talked with the owners and I took the tour of it this weekend. Yeah. And at one point at the end of the tour, I was trying to take pictures and I watched this mist float right across the tunnel, right, right in front of me, about 10 feet away. Of course, it was in between Ooh. me snapping pictures. It waited for me to get in between before it showed up. So I didn't get it in any of my photos, but uh, it seems like there's a lot of activity there. So hopefully we can get that one scheduled soon. Yeah, where is this place? In Idaho Springs, which is um, west of Denver by about a half an hour. Um, yeah. It's an old mining town, mining community, lots and lots of mines up there, gold mines. And, you know, you know something I learned during the mine tours, they don't, the United States does not allow gold mining here in the u.s they they stopped it no they uh they don't want to devalue the dollar it's not like the dollar is on the gold standard or anything anymore but yet they uh all the independent mine owners they shut them down and won't let them and it's it's a shame because they think they can pull another three million dollars worth of gold out of that mine and uh as you walk through the tour they're even showing you you can see nuggets in the ceiling and you're not allowed to touch them yeah, and silver seams as well. There was one silver, there, wasn't there? There was gold, silver, copper, um, and iron. A lot, and you could see the vein just running right through it. Um, it it's amazing. And, and the government doesn't allow them to, um, to mine it. So go figure. Such a well, shame. Well, you'll have plenty of fun investigating it, I'm sure. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to mm. it. should be interesting. I know uh, Ghost Adventures shot an episode there about a year ago, and, well, let's just say they're not very happy with the Ghost Adventures team, especially Zach. Oh, the owners. Yeah, the owners and the managers. Uh, no? Nah, I kept hearing the word moron being repeated lots. <laughs> Now, I've never met Zach, so I cannot confirm that he is, in fact, a moron. But uh, they didn't seem to be care for him too much. So, uh, c'est la vie. So, hopefully, we can go in there and actually find some real evidence. Haven't we had him on one of our shows, no? No, he doesn't go on anybody's shows. I think he's oh. too too much in love with himself to go on other people's shows. You obviously don't like him very much. I'm, I love the show. It's my guilty pleasure. I just watch the show, and I love it, and I laugh at every time they do something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, they do everything wrong. Well, let's Which is why they have such shows like that. Far too many. Far too many shows like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. But speaking of shows, who's our guest for this evening? Well, today, tonight... Tonight, we've got MJ Dixon. MJ Dixon, she's from the West Midlands in the UK, and she runs Sage Paranormal. And I'm not going to say any more about it, because I want her to tell us all about it. Hello, MJ. Are you there? Good evening. How are you guys doing today? Hiya. We're doing good. Thank you for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. Uh, Thank you for having me. I'm doing all right. I'm just holding on here. You know, I feel like a zombie. I'm half asleep, worn out, knackered, aches and pains everywhere. And Amen my house looks that. Yeah, and my house, honestly, I love my grandchildren. I really do. And I love them coming to stay with me. But I love sending them back home to their mothers as well because my house <laughs> looks like it's been hit by a hurricane. Oh, I'm, I'm, I tell you, I can't find anything in this house at the moment. No, I can't find anything in my house, and I'm the only person to blame for that. So <laughs> <laughs> it's been one of those weeks. My goodness, the last few days has been so up and down and just really hectic. We've got a lot going on. So uh, I've yeah. been trying to cram as much as possible into into a day and been a bit overwhelming, but good. So you've been actually working all over the bank holiday then? I have. I have. I've, I've not oh, you're a dedicated, break. dedicated it, yeah. girl. That's, that's, what, if that's what you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just really made the big mistake of announcing our 2018 really big project in 2017, really early on. <laughs> so wait, no, wait a minute. I've, you've got a big... Oh, sorry, I've just... Clouted. Sorry, any, anyone that heard that. I've just clouted the microphone. <laughs> so, so you've got a big project coming off in 2018. You've announced it in 2017, but we haven't mm -hmm. heard it yet. What is it? 
I have put together a 10-day paranormal adventure. Um, and Ooh. it's May 2018. We're going to be heading to Venice, Italy. Uh huh. Uh, and it starts with three days in Venice. We're going to be doing a few tours and investigating. Um, and then we go from Venice, we get on a cruise ship and we do a seven day paranormal cruise. So it'll have a few guest speakers on board, a few lectures. Uh, we'll do some fun things that we, uh, we usually do at our events. Um, there'll be some lip sync battles and all sorts going on, but it is a really nice tour with, uh, all things paranormal. Uh, oh, for 10 God, days. Do, do you know, I may just come because I've got friends in Venice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There's an excuse. <laughs> yeah. That's an excuse to visit them and also trot along with you as well. Now, yeah, if, yeah. If you're, oh, that would well, be brilliant. If you're going to so Venice, we, of course, you have. To, uh, are, are you going to be able to get on Paveglia Island? We can't say yes or no at this point. Um, Paveglia don't actually allow any of the public onto the island due to health and safety. So it is something that we are aiming for. Um, however, there is a lot of red tape to get through. So I am trying, um, and hopefully we will have good news and be granted the, the permission to go onto the island. But as it stands, I don't want to say anything more about it um, with where we stand at the moment. Just I don't want people to be disappointed. I'm not, I'm not going to be saying that's guaranteed um you know they could very well say yes and then right at the last minute change their minds for some reason so it is a bit touch and go with Pavelia. they are very very sticky with it um, yeah but, but um, mj 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 the island has been done to death over the years but venice itself now that's a different thing see this is it this is just the thing um i'd love to go to Pavelia, obviously i mean if you're yeah. there it's it is a bit of because everybody's been and everybody knows that it's really active and I mm -hmm. don't think that everything there is hashtag it's a demon. Um, you know, <laughs> Zach, are you listening? <laughs> hey, don't he hates me already. <laughs> um, so you know, just for the fact that it it is the history of the of the island, it is the fact that you know they they took so many. Uh, plague victims and and people back then that even had the common cold they were kind of shipped out there and so yeah. i just think in general the history is really interesting um it's really sad and it would be nice to go and explore it a bit but you're right there are other venues Ooh, in this is it in venice, venice. That are venice you had the borgias for a start yeah let's face so, it yeah, so um, I'm a bit of a there are other places like. that we're looking into. There, there will be an investigation of some sort in Venice. Um, we're also going to be doing some sort of myths and legends tours and that sort of stuff as well, and and a bit of the the creepier history of Venice. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um, okay. And then the cruise. So, we, yeah, I was just going to say the paranormal cruise. Where are you going? Yeah. We, we stop in, start in Venice. We go from there to Bari, Italy. Yeah. Um, from there, we do three Greek ports. So we do Katakalon, um, we do Mykonos, and we yeah. do um, Piraeus, so Athens, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, we head to Albania, to Saranda. And then the last stop is, uh, gone blank, oh, Dubrovnik, Croatia. <gasps> yeah. So yeah, you know you got Old Town Dubrovnik. Saranda's got mm. some beautiful. Um, there's we're going to be doing a bit more of an outdoorsy adventure in Saranda, um, and then obviously Athens. You've got you know the Parthenon and all of that. So it's very very history related kind of myths and legends, Greek mythology and all of that. So I mean it's going to be interesting, and then we'll have a convention on board. So to top it off. It's going to be great. But, that sounds brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. I haven't even, I, do you know what? We've put this together and we start releasing all the details in a few weeks um, with regards to all the tours and things that we're doing and everything that's involved in the package. But I haven't even finished organizing this year's major event. So. That so, one uh, you were going to tell us about tonight as well. No problem. 
we'll get into mm-hmm. that. We'll we'll have a talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, why don't we do this? Why don't, for our listeners who may not be uh, familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about your background and and yes. how you know what your experience has been and how you formed uh, say your Sage Paranormal Group? Okay. Um, well, my mum is a psychic medium. Um, she tried to block it out for most of her life. She tried to. Um, I wouldn't say shelter us kids from it. You know, we were brought up with, hey, there is something more out there. Um, and if strange things happened in our household growing up, it was it was never explained away. It was kind of like, oh, wow, you know, that is so-and-so, or, you know, it's a family member or whatever. Um, so I had, you know, the, the mom side and the psychic side. And then my dad, my father was um, a military man for many years. He served in a few different countries and that. So he was really straight and narrow, um, seeing is believing, real skeptic. However, he never questioned my mom's abilities. He never he never once went, oh, crazy lady, or well, maybe in a joking manner, but never, you know, and we all used to say I'm, I'm from the Adams family. Um, we're all a bit strange. So growing up, you know, I had the best of both worlds. I had the psychic medium. I had the logical side of things, my dad's side and being very rational, which really helped later on in life when I realized that I'd sort of inherited my mom's gift, um, ability, gift, call it what you will. Um, And so when I started first picking up on things and I naturally thought I was going nuts, I then started investigating the paranormal so that I could kind of validate everything I was picking up on, Um, which again was more of my dad's side of me that came out. I had to be able to take everything apart and kind of figure it out and and put it all back together. I think that's why I'm still investigating. So you kind of questioned it. You questioned everything. You you really have to have a really decent, um, healthy skepticism when it comes to this, it doesn't matter whether you're a psychic medium or not. You can't just walk into a place and go, oh, yeah, that's paranormal. You know, you yeah. really have to get down to the nitty gritty of it. And and once uh, you've spent the time trying to debunk it, whatever you then cannot explain is therefore possibly paranormal. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah well, um, that's the same with our group, isn't it, Mark? We take everything apart. Literally you everything need to. apart. Yeah, it's so yeah. important to do that. Mm. Um, so when I when I moved to the UK, because I'm actually South African. Um, well, I say that I grew up in South Africa. I'm born in Zimbabwe, so a very confused child, really. <laughs> um, Your parents uh, South African, or are they British or what? My mum is Rhodesian, and mm. my father was Greek Cypriot. So uh-huh. yeah. yeah, real combination. <laughs> mm. Um, so, um, when I first moved over to the UK, it's when I really started picking up on things psychically and it was really overwhelming for me because I, I never listened to my mom growing up. She always said, let me help you. Let me, let me teach you how to handle things. And I went, you're a crazy lady. So I never listened to her. And then I moved over to the UK and everything really started developing and, I found my mom and I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what's going on. You know, can you help? And she went, nope, you're on your own. Uh, You wouldn't accept my help when I offered it. So learn. (laughs) That's nice. Um, Yeah, That's a a typical mom. That's the sort sort of thing I'd come out with. That is. Yep. Tough love. Yeah, but coming over to the UK, you know, UK is uh, one of the most haunted countries in the world. Exactly. So, I mean, you've got to be bombarded because there's a ghost on every bloody corner over literally, here. Literally. It was like that. You know, I moved into this really nice little house um, and, it, well, a little apartment. And it was pretty much adjacent to a really old hotel. Um, and the hotel was extremely active. But what I found was everything from the hotel was kind of spilling over into our place. And I then found out that the house was built on the grounds of the gallows where allegedly 18 people were publicly hanged. So (laughs) to throw that in the works, um, so everything was really overwhelming. And I, I reached out to another paranormal team local to this area and I met up with them 
and the moment their medium walked in, um, she sat down next to me and I looked at her and I went, you're like me. Like, wait, 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 how do I know this? How do I just, I can feel it. You're like me. And she just looked at me. She's like, yep. And I was like, I really need your help. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was my mum won't first... help me. So you've got to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I was like, please, please, please. I won't take no for an answer. <laughs> um, oh. And that's that was the day that I met Liz, who is Sage Paranormal's resident medium. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've, we clicked. She really helped me understand everything. She was literally an angel. Um, if it wasn't for her, I don't know, I probably would have lost my mind. Mm. It was really scary at the time being very overwhelmed by just so much more in the UK, as you said. So Liz and I started working together. We started investigating and that's kind of how Sage was formed. And I think that was back in 2008. So Sage actually came out of just you two. Yeah, that's wow. it. Straight from the beginning. It was just the two of us. Um, and, you know, we have had other team members through the years. We've had three other team members over the years. And um, unfortunately, one of them had to move back to Cyprus. Yeah, he was he was over here. He was living in London and then he came and joined the team um, and he moved back to Cyprus and fell in love and is living happily ever after over there. And um, I do love a go. I love story. I do love. It. Yeah, I, I'm you just going to say I do we, love a ghost story, but I do love a love story. <laughs> we um we really miss him. We you know it would be great to have him back over and just do a little impromptu investigation, get the old crew back together. Yeah. Um, and then we also had another guy that was part of the team, Liam, who moved down to London and got a really good job in the film industry. Um, so he's also doing very well. And then Carl Hutchinson, who a lot of people know, um, he was with Sage for quite some time. And Carl took some time out for personal reasons with family and health and things. So, I mean, we, we haven't really ever had a really big team. It's always been kind of, I think, the most people Liz, at once was Liz. four. And we're yeah. back to myself and Liz. You know, it's just the two of us. We, we do our thing, do our investigations. And we, we love yeah. joining up with other teams. Yeah, but what you do, the two of you, you're really successful at. You are successful at, and you are getting so known over here in the UK. <laughs> I know, know, it's quite funny. We, you know, I don't know, we've we've started our little sage tribe. We've worked with so many <laughs> wonderful teams in the UK. Um, yeah. I must admit, we've really collaborated with some amazing teams in the UK. Um on several investigations and I will highly recommend them to anyone. You know, it's, it's great working with other people that take it seriously and that are really in it for the research and do try and debunk things. So we've had some great investigations with, with fellow teams. Um, we've, we've put a lot of work in really, you know, we've built ourselves up really slowly. We've got a great group of people that we, investigate with that we yeah post little talks and things and just aim to share whatever we've learned really mm. no, MJ, my old i was sorry mark do you want to go or no I go? Ask, go ahead and comment and then i'll ask a question uh my old team that i used to have spirit rescue international which was worldwide i had over 30 people working on that wow. over 30 and uh from all different countries and that was really that's that was amazing. really good yeah, but we saw the um, supernatural research. Uh, come on, Mark, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> we we came up with the most convoluted, long, na uh, impossible to remember name in the world. We're Supernatural Analysis and Research Institute. We call ourselves Sari for short. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> we cut it down to a more sizable, manageable team. You know, it's funny. But Everybody always says to me, they're like, "Oh, what does Sage mean?" And I'm like. Sage. <laughs> it doesn't mean like spirits and ghostly entities. No, it just means sage. Like I love the herb. I love everything oh, yeah. about I'm sage. I'm trying I to grow some out the back. <laughs> Is that I all? Bought, I bought I bought some um, sage back from Italy, a packet of sage because the leaves out there 
are four times the size of the British mm-hmm. sage that we grow over here. They are massive. Uh huh. Sure, it's sage. I believe you. Uh huh. <laughs> I haven't gone on to gardening here. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying. Yeah, sure. It's sage. Uh huh. Just tell everybody mm-hmm. it's sage. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's sage. Okay. <laughs> Right, anybody who wants to hear about my gardening and my Italian herbs that I bought back from Italy last year, I will post it all on Facebook for you. Okay. <laughs> she's trying to she's trying to hide the evidence now. Yeah. <laughs> she's gonna go to Asda and buy some sage now. <laughs> well, MJ, MJ, I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know, you grew up sensitive. Um and and you said your mother was also sensitive. Um, yes. In what ways are you sensitive? How did you start to realize that you started to sense certain things that possibly other people couldn't? Well, you know, certain things would happen um, in our household, and I would always be able to pick up on a presence that was there. And I was, I could, I could feel that there was somebody else in the room, but I couldn't pinpoint who it was. Um, I didn't know if it was male or female or if it was family or just a random person. All I knew at the time was there's someone else here. I'm not alone. And it was was really strong. MJ, is this out in South Africa or when you came over to the UK? It was in South Africa. Oh, okay. Um, And then, you know, so things would happen like electrical appliances would switch on and off on their own doors would open and close you'd hear footsteps or lights switching on and off and i would freak out and then go no no i can find a logical explanation for this and i would kind of explain it away and my mom would be like oh don't worry it's just your grandmother like what the hell you're crazy (laughs) like no this is and i could always feel that there was actually something there so Soon enough, it started, I started sensing like, oh, okay, this is a male presence, or this is a female presence, or being more in tune with it. Um, And it scared the hell out of me, so I still didn't quite embrace it. And I grew up with my husband. I've known him since I was 12 years old. Um, he was 14. Oh, another love story. Yeah, a really, really sweet one. (laughs) He, I married the boy next door. Um, Mm. but we were really, really close friends. And, and I always said, you know, I come from the Adams family. We were always laughing and joking about it. And so when we started dating and, and we got engaged, my, my parents said to us, why don't you move back into our place and I'll help you save towards your wedding or your honeymoon or whatever, instead of paying rent just for a few months. So we're like, okay, move back in. And I said to my husband Duncan, I was like, you know, my mom does say the craziest things every now and again, so just just ignore her. She's she's weird. And the one night I woke up about three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, with somebody holding my ankles down in the bed, like this pressure. And I kind of woke up and tried to move and realized that I couldn't move my legs and panic set in. So I woke up and I saw my uncle stood at the end of my bed. And he was really excited and he was trying to tell me something. My uncle passed away when I was three years old. So I saw him stood at the end of the bed and he looked exactly the way I remember him from photographs. So I knew who he was. But the fact that my uncle was stood at the end of the bed trying to tell me something and it was like almost like I couldn't quite hear him. I literally flipped out completely. I started crying. I couldn't breathe. I was hyperventilating. I it was just the shock. The I couldn't talk. I was in such shock. Um, and my husband woke up and he was like, "What's going on?" And eventually, I said to him, "I don't know how to tell you this, but my my uncle stood at the end of the bed trying to talk to me, and he just went, he looked at me with this blank facial expression, and he was like, "Okay, maybe you just had a dream." And I was like, "No, no, no, I'm looking right at him." He's still there. I'm wide awake. I'm talking to you. And, you know, he calmed me down and I got up in the morning about just after six o'clock and I walked out of the bedroom and my mom walked out of her room and she looked at me and she's like, wow, my girl, you look really tired. And I was like, yeah, you know, I didn't sleep well. And she's like, yeah, me neither. Your uncle came to visit me last night and he woke me up and he was trying to tell me something that I couldn't quite hear what he was saying. And my husband just went the whitest shade of pale. 
<laughs> and I looked at her and she must have realized from both of our facial expressions, she was like, oh, did he come and visit you last night? And I'm stood there going, did your dead uncle come and what the hell is wrong with this family? Like, <laughs> that is not normal. Like, that is not a thing. You, you don't just say that. You don't just, did your dead uncle come and visit you? How weird is this? <laughs> so that's when, you know, that was the first big thing that really, really scared me. And I was like, wow, don't mm. tell me I've got what mom's got. You know, I've got the I speak to dead people gene. Great. Um, and that was shortly before we moved to the UK. Yeah. So when I moved over here and it all kicked in, it really started kicking in. Um, now I've realized that I am a clear cognizant medium. So I mm -hmm. receive information as if it's my own memories. Mm -hmm. I just know things, which is really random. But I do also hear them quite clearly. Um, so, yeah, between the, the clear auditory phenomena that comes through every now and again um, mm. and the clear cognizance, I kind of put a picture together and can give you the information. So that's the very long story of... <laughs> <laughs> You've How been a medium. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you're talking that you talk sorry Mark, I've done it again, haven't I? It's oh okay. Good. it's all right. I'm always interrupting Mark because I like to step on him. <laughs> sorry, Mark. I, but I was gonna say you were saying that he held your ankles down. We have a toe puller in this house, right? Oh yeah, we have a toe puller. And I had my toe pulled again the other night, and I sat up in bed in the dark, and I swung a punch. God <laughs> knows why I swung a punch, I don't know, because it wouldn't have done anything. But I swung a punch on the end of a word that began with F yeah. and ended with off. <laughs> but what made I, uh, me swing a punch, I don't know. I really don't. I think you've got anger issues. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in my <laughs> frustration of having the kids all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> that must be it. It's just it all built up, and you're going to take it out on Herbert. Yeah, yeah, I but I don't. I don't think Herbert. Punch Herbert's punch. not the one. Hmm? Sorry. My uh, my dad had an experience, and it it was probably one of his first really big experiences that I remember him having. But he, obviously, he tried to explain it away at the time. Yeah. But um, my brother and I had gone out and my dad woke up at about 11 o'clock at night. He thought he heard me calling him from the living room and I sounded like I was panicking. So he rushed mm. through to the living room. And as he got there, it looked like this massive black figure stood up off the sofa in front of him. And he got a really huge fright with this massive figure standing up. So he threw a punch and he went straight through it and fell over the sofa. Um, oh. So he ended up taking a tumble over the sofa after throwing such a, a forceful punch I, at I whoever this was. Yeah, I shouldn't laugh, but I would have loved to have seen it. <laughs> I know, right? I would have paid money to see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, we actually got home at about three o'clock in the morning because at the time we were driving home and there was a massive thunderstorm and the car got stuck in mud on yeah. one of the farm roads and we couldn't get the car out of the mud we were really battling we were really stuck our phones had died so we had no way of contacting my dad so yeah, yeah it was but, around I bet that didn't that do that anything happened. for your stiletto heels did it no nope, not <laughs> at all uh, and neither did my brother revving the car and me having mud splashed all over me but, <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he made you at the back stand at the back and oh push yeah of course he did yeah, yeah was, that's typical. What are brothers for? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, what did you want to say? Um, well, I'm just curious when uh, you started to pick up on these uh, on these feelings, clear clear audience, and starting to pick up on information. When did you decide at that point to start looking into the paranormal and and start researching it? Well, because my mom had always said to me, you know, let me teach you. You need to learn as much as you can. Um, and my mom's always been, I've always been a bookworm. I am a massive bookworm. Um, so my mom always went, you know, you can find some really decent books and these things can explain stuff better that maybe, you know, in a way that you understand that maybe the way I explain it doesn't quite fit. Um, so 
you know, when I started speaking to my mom about it after the, the whole experience with my uncle, and I said to her, look, help. And she was like, nope, <laughs> figure it out. Learn on your own. I kind of, being the stubborn child that I am, went on a mission to learn as much as possible. Um, just to kind of prove my point to my mom that, hey, look, I can do this. <laughs> so it's just the stubborn side of me. So I did, pretty much after the experience with my uncle, is where I really started looking into it. Um, I started watching more paranormal shows and I was like, oh, hey, so you can you can use equipment for this. So I'm gonna test myself and see what I can pick up in a location and then try and validate that with the equipment. So I started learning how the equipment was made, who made it, why did they make it, how was it used, what experiments you could use it for. Um, yeah, I just, I'm a bookworm. I read constantly. I learn things constantly. So, and I still don't know a quarter of it. You know, you, anyone that says they are the number one team or. It doesn't you know, exist. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist. It, you are always learning. You're even now, after knowing nothing. <laughs> yeah, even now, after 50 odd years in it, I'm learning new stuff every day. Exactly. It's a field that we know, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface, That's you right. know. So you are always learning. Um, mm -hmm. so, and it really, it, it grates me so badly when you see somebody advertising, oh, I am the number one. No, you're not. No. Hold it right there. <laughs> we are, we're, as Sage, we've built up quite a reputation through working with people and investigating and some of the evidence that we've been able to capture. Yeah. Um, you know, and we only got there through hard work and working with other people. And everyone's quick to throw around that, that word, that para unity, but no one actually really embraces it that much these days. So, you yeah. know, if you want, you want people to know who you are, what? Well, I'm, af I'm afraid all the time there's egos in this field. Exactly, you are leave never... the egos behind. That's all right. That's it. Leave the egos behind. Leave because the... you're not number one. You would never be number one. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. And the, the title and what can you? And, and this is it. How can you judge yourself as number one? What do you put it up against? Exactly. Well, well, what you're, exactly. what part of the problem is, there's, it's twofold. The two problems with the paranormal are, one, television. TV mm -hmm. shows to conventions. And Why do you say conventions? Because oh. this is where, and it's not the conventions. Conventions over there, Mark, are quite a bit different to conventions over here. But what the point on that is, it's not the conventions themselves are bad. It's no. but when a group is is trying to pit themselves uh, up against their competition as they look at it, they look at other <laughs> groups. They measure themselves. I mean, in the old days, when I when I first started with this in my group, you just had a group and you went out and you investigated. Then it mm -hmm. started turning into, uh, you know, I was in New Jersey at the time, and it started turning into there were a couple of people in New Jersey who had it out to be the biggest teams in the state. You know, they wanted that recognition. Then the convention circuit started, and people mm -hmm. started going to these conventions. Now it's these people going to every single convention out there, the over mm -hmm. and over and over again, trying to promote themselves. Um, to it's get the same to, old, same old yeah, people get doing more fame yeah. and fortune, and even people who have all these television shows, and and yeah. this is what infuriates me is these people who do these television shows, and then they turn right around and show up on all these conventions, like yes, you have so and so from this television show, and, and what about the zombies then? The well, zombies, but but the <laughs> but with these people in the, on the television shows, more often than not, they don't know anything. You know, they, they you know get... this is you are so right with that. I mean, being a person that hosts a convention, um, I have mm. the Sage Paracon here in the UK, um, mm. and we do have speakers that have been on television shows. However, the speakers that we do have from shows, and you know, it's funny because I've turned down a lot of people that have contacted me to be speakers. So I've got speakers coming out of the woodwork. Everybody wants to be a speaker and get that recognition. So, you know, I've, I received quite 
a substantial amount of emails with, can I be a speaker at your event? You know, I've been on this TV show, or I've done this, or I've done that. But I want speakers that, yes, okay, maybe they have been on TV, but they truly do have the experience in the field. They have been doing this. For a really, really this long is it. time. But the point, the point is, MJ, is people that have been, it's people, it's people love the, it's speakers that have been on the telly that put bums on seats, right, because mm -hmm. they've been on the telly. But that doesn't mean to say that they are, like you say, the best speakers. The best speakers are the exactly. ones that haven't been on the telly that are dedicated to what they're talking about. You know, you know? I, I fully agree with you there. This is why we've, I mean, one of our... I say one, I'm, I'm pinpointing one now. One of our speakers this year, she's never done a convention. Um, she's the author of a book. Her name is Nikki Folsom. And she wrote a book about a particular location that she has investigated on numerous occasions and documented her experiences. Um, but she's never been in a, in a convention like as a speaker. She's never, you know, she's investigated for a really long time. And she's a wonderful, lovely person. And so yeah. I said to her, you know, I would love to hear your stories. I would love to know what you do differently during an investigation. I want to know about this location. I want to. So it's not she's not in it for fame or fortune. She's not. She's a genuine, serious investigator. Um, yeah. And she's really lovely. You know, and then we've got this year, we've got John Zaffis as one of our guest speakers. Yeah, we know John. I mean, yeah. John's been in the industry as an investigator for 43 years or so. Yes, I know John well. Uh, I know Brian Cano. I saw your picture yeah. with him. Uh, you know, I know Brian well from New Jersey. I knew him before he got on Honored Collector. And Brian's going to be with us this year, too. Yeah, but you know, and again, and, and it's, I don't want to sound like I'm picking on, on them, especially John Zaff. John Zaff has a huge name in the industry. And I don't exactly agree with a lot of what he does because it seems more that these last, uh, I don't know, since I've known him the last few years, he spends his entire time doing the convention circuit. He had his television show. He does the convention circuit. He has his museum. But it's not investigating so much as following in the you, footsteps of his aunt. You would actually be very surprised. Um you know, John does do quite a fair share of investigating. We actually had, because I was recently in Salem um, at the 22nd of April. I was over in Salem, Massachusetts for the Salem Con, which was a fantastic event. Um, and John and Brian were both speakers there. Mm -hmm. So I got the opportunity to actually sit down and have a chat to John um, about the investigating and about all of that. And he actually does a lot more than... It's he, there's two sides from what I've seen. I mean, I, obviously, I don't know John extremely well, but from what I've seen is that he has his private cases that he does and his investigations that he does. Okay. Um, he's got his team that he investigates with as well, but he keeps all of that out of the spotlight. Right. Like, yeah, yeah, I thought he was semi-retired. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's one of those people that again puts bums in seats at conventions because he does have a wealth of knowledge and he's always willing to share it. You know, I had some really interesting conversations with him over the weekend at Salem Con and learned quite a few things in a short space and time. His lectures were really informative. Um, so. Again, he's a very nice bloke. Oh, yeah. And, nice. and I don't want to make it sound like I'm picking on John because I like John. He's a very nice guy. And uh, because I don't work with him, I don't see that side of it. You know, I attended one lecture of his a few years ago, but it was a basic paranormal one on one lecture. And, and of course, it was so basic, I was bored. So, uh, but I've also had great conversations. There was one night after a convention in Gettysburg uh, where a bunch of us sat around until four in the morning discussing the Amityville case. And of course, his aunt and uncle were involved in the Amityville case. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one of our other investigators that was there, Jason Gowan, who, who had a personal relationship with George Lutz, the father before he died. Uh, I've I've met uh, Christopher Lutz, the youngest child. I've interviewed him, haven't we? Yeah, on the show. So we had a lot of unique perspectives on that case, which was really interesting. So yeah, I don't want to make it sound like I'm bashing John at all. And John, if you're listening, I apologize, man. I'm not I'm not putting you down. <laughs> it's just no. I thought you were semi-retired, John. Yeah, yeah. I guess that was it. Plus, some of the things with 
you know, the whole demonology but, aspect of it but is... Mark, Mark, getting back, getting back to that Gettysburg one, what was it called again now? Because I could never say it when it used to go on. Well, uh, phenomenology. Yeah, phenomenology. Phenomenal- they, they ran for seven years. Phenomenal- phenomenology, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they always blasted, invited the zombies, which was... They were extras out the program, weren't they? Well, that's where I get uh, I get frustrated with some of these paranormal um, conventions because they start extras. they start bringing in like the horror movie people, and yeah. it's like two different things here, guys. We're trying to discuss you know real paranormal research here, and then you're bringing in extras who played zombies in The Walking Dead. I mean. <laughs> It's... You know, okay, so last year, the Sage Paracon, we actually had a zombie theme. But um, what we did, all of our speakers were genuine paranormal investigators. You know, they... Um, you had like a, a dressed up as zombies. But, so not the speakers and things. That side of the convention, the lectures and things, that was taken very seriously. You know, it was the fun side of it. So we had... In yeah. a separate part of the convention, we, where we had all the stalls, we had ten local bands playing on a stage throughout the day. We had um, some guys who were extras in The Walking Dead and all of that. We had them with their special effects makeup artists doing zombie choreography. So teaching you how to act like a zombie. They did <laughs> special effects makeup demos. Um, they had like a, a whole zombie section where you could go and have your makeup done. They taught you how to do it. They taught you how to zombify your clothing and that for like a fancy dress party. They did the zombie choreography. We even had Zoga in the morning. We had some yoga going on, but then all the special effects guys and, and some of the extras that were all walking around in full special effects makeup um, they decided they wanted to do the yoga in the morning, so our yoga class turned out to be zombie yoga, zoga. <laughs> yeah, but you <laughs> you do it different. You see, you yeah. do it different over there. What were they doing? They were invited, but they just mingled in with the crowd. Yeah, and but that was it's it. just Why having not? a having a convention table. I mean, I, I don't uh, I, I don't have a thing about having fun at these events. It's all about having fun. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, maybe but, we're maybe we're getting off topic here because for for me, it's it's I'm just so interested in learning more about the paranormal. And you start off with these groups, you know, that everybody's fighting who's the best, and and when you really look at all their techniques, they're doing things that we they were doing 20 years ago, which are so outdated. Mm-hmm. They have outdated methods. Nobody wants to really talk and take things to the next level, which in my opinion is taking a serious look at the interdimensional aspects of reality. And the reality is so different than what we think when people, yeah, well, that's can, what we study, isn't it? Yeah, when people continue to regurgitate the same thing, Oh yeah, this house is haunted. This guy, he died. He doesn't know he's dead. He's still walking around and whatever. And mm-hmm. not ruling out that that might be a possibility, but people jump to conclusions so much because that's what they've been taught through, you know, growing Mm up um, tradition and these ghost shows that don't do anything else but cater to the lowest common denominator. And of course, they get really upset when they go on an investigation and don't get 15 EVPs before the first commercial break. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) True, true, so true. Yeah. Or depending if it's some of the shows that I've been on, they fake them. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, yeah, so yeah. Place. People have heard our stories ad nauseum yeah. just with the paranormal TV yeah. shows, but we're not going to well, focus my, on the sh- them. The last show I was on, they were working off a script. Oh, there you go. Nightmare. Yeah, I had a producer try to tell me to change my story. And like, no. <laughs> so they cut me. Wow. Yeah, yep, yeah, basically. So, um,. W- Let's talk a bit about the investigations that you've you've done with your team. Um, okay. uh, what has been your primary focus? How, do you look into like uh, historical locations, or do you work with people, you know, with private homes or businesses who are having issues? We, What's your focus? We don't do private homes or businesses. Um, personally, I still think that I am a rookie in this field. I've been doing this for about eight nine years um and i still think i am a baby in this field i do not think that i have enough information as yet 
to be able to go into somebody's house and help them whatever if they claim it's a haunting or whatever the situation may be because personally i think that a lot of the times with the private case there's much deeper issues there might be abuse in the home that you don't know about yeah, there might like very that. well exactly you know there's there's more medical things that you need to know about there's i don't have enough information regarding all of that to put myself in a position to say to a family that look yes i'm going to come into your house and rid it of all your demons and help you and you're going to be honky dory mm. when i leave no because i can't promise that well and you know it's what nobody unknown. can nobody can exactly but uh, exactly so it's i mean i i have helped out a few people where they've said look i'm really really scared i'm really worried i've got kids at home do you mind coming to see if you can pick up on anything or and I have gone in, um, been able to explain a lot of it with science, like a lot of the paranoia, the headaches, the et cetera, was due to a really high electromagnetic field in a certain part of the room um, right next to the bed. So basically this young guy was sleeping with this speaker on right next to his head, uh, this massive big speaker system. But it was giving off the highest EMF. Mm -hmm. um, so he was he was sleeping within that EMF field, like his head right next to it throughout the whole night. So he was getting these headaches and feeling paranoid and nausea and the hair on his neck would stand up. He'd feel like someone stood over him in the bed. He got really anxious about everything. And I mean, I went in and all I did was take the mel meter and have a look around because from what he explained... To me, it sounded like the effects of EMF on the human body. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, okay, well, do you mind taking me through your room? Let me have a look at where everything is, blah, blah, blah. And started measuring the EMF, got to the speaker system. It was off the charts. So I was like, oh, my goodness, do yourself a favor. At night, before you go to bed, just unplug the speaker system. Don't sleep with that plugged in or on. And I called them up about three days later, and I was like, how are things? He's like, perfect. I feel great. This is the best night's sleep I've had in ages. That was it. It was just mm -hmm. the paranoia and all of that was sleeping in a high EMF field. And, and that's also, you touch on a great point there, the fact of, of a group like yours going in and looking for the explanation, whatever it is. If it's, mm -hmm. if it's exactly. paranormal, fine, and if you can capture evidence of it and figure out what you're dealing with is good. But it's also mm -hmm. ruling out those natural factors because so often people, and, and God knows this has happened uh, to me here in the States, every time, you know, I've got the last several private home cases I went on, almost in every case it was somebody who's watched too many ghost shows and mm -hmm. they had convinced, they demons. convinced themselves there's demons in the house. Yeah. So, and this is another thing. So, you know, we don't... We don't really do private cases. If somebody says to me, look, do you mind coming and having a look and see if you feel anything in the house? I'd, I'd be glad to go and do it and see what I can pick up. But am I going to rid your house of whatever's there? No. Mediums that go, oh, I'm going to send it off into the light. I'm going to cross them over. Well, guess what? Crossing them over, I kind of think you've got free will on this side. So you're going to have free will on that side. So if that person doesn't want to go, it might not be that easy. Um, so I just, I don't, I don't know. It's never been a thing for me. I'd love to help people. I really would. but You're maybe just, not destined to do it that way, MJ. Do you know, I just, I don't think I have enough know-how just yet. And it annoys me so badly when you have these kids that watch the shows, put on a black T-shirt, grab a K2 meter, <laughs> and all of a sudden they are going to rid your entire house of every demon ever. Yeah. Um, and they go into a house of a family that genuinely is in a very sensitive situation. They mm -hmm. believe there is something there. They are therefore afraid of whatever's there because it's the unknown. They are scared mm -hmm. of what they don't know. Exactly. So, you know, whether it be a logical scientific explanation or whether it actually be paranormal, they don't know that. And it scares them. So they're vulnerable. They're worried. They're jumping at their own shadows in the, in the house. And then you have this young team that go in and go, uh-huh, uh-huh. 
yes, there's a demon here. Yeah, and, and they're the ones that usually they're the ones that usually stir up all the shite, and then there's people like me that have to go and sort it out. Exactly, exactly. You know, mm. they stir things up. They don't know what they're dealing with. They really stir things up really badly. They provoke. They do this. They do that. And then come two, three o'clock in the morning, they go, "All right, well, um, we're going to pack up and head home." And that poor family is now left in that house in an absolute state of distress because somebody's come in, told them, and obviously they're wearing a black T-shirt and they have equipment, so they must be professionals. So to this poor family, they've had somebody come in, do all these tests with these flashing lights and blah, blah, blah that they don't understand, told them their house is haunted, yes, it's a demon, and left. Yeah. So... Again, that's true. So don't do it, kids. For God's don't sake, do just don't <laughs> do it. <laughs> so yeah, I I don't do private cases. I mean, we do field trips. We do um, investigating historic locations and just interesting places. I'd like okay. to connect whatever I'm picking up psychically, whatever Liz picks up as a psychic medium, because she is amazing. She's also a claircognizant medium. We work very similar um mm. so the two of us will go and we won't speak to each other about it most of the time i'll write things down in notes and i won't tell her anything because if she picks up on the exact same thing that's validation for me and then me showing her the notes that's validation for her that's true that's a very good um, way of doing it as well uh and so mj tell me a little bit about um liz you say that she's really sensitive um, what is she able to pick up and work with? Liz is also a claircognizant medium. However, she's also a trans medium. Um, and now I didn't know anything about trans mediumship at all. Um, so when I first met her and, and she explained it, I was really taken aback. It was the idea of it was really terrifying. Um, to be honest, it's not something that she does very often. Um, we don't really do things like that on an investigation. However, it is something that has happened during certain investigations. But she is she's phenomenal at explaining exactly what a location looks like, you know, 80 years ago or 100 years ago. She will walk through with whoever the, the landlord is or whoever from the location. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, she'll explain to them, like, oh, there was a wall here and a door here, and it looked like this and this and that. And they're like, yeah, how do you know that? And she's like, well, I can see it. Um, so it's really interesting. It's it's definitely brings a different element to an investigation. You know, if you have people that say, well, they keep seeing an apparition or a shadow figure that keeps walking through the wall in a certain area, she's like, well, yeah, that's because there used to be a door there. Um so it, it kind of helps us map out places in an unusual way. But she is very accurate with descriptions. Um, she kind of sees things as if it's her own memory really clearly. And um, we've, we really do work quite a bit on the same level. I mean, people that have investigated with us before, you know, we've, we'll be sitting in a particular room with other investigators having a conversation about something and all of a sudden myself and Liz will both stop at the exact same moment and look towards the door. And we're both looking in the same direction going, huh, that's interesting. And people will go like, Oh, what, what did you pick up? And we'll both go, Oh, there's a really tall guy at the door. And we'll start laughing because we've both picked up on the exact same thing at the exact same time. Um, which is why I say, you know, most most mediums work on different frequencies. Um, you can never really discredit a medium that if you're working with them and they go, hey, I'm picking up on a little girl here, and you go, well, hey, I'm not picking that up at all. It's not to say that they're lying or that they're wrong. It just might mean that they're working on a slightly different frequency to you. I was just about to say, you're really in tune with each other, aren't you? We are. We are extremely mm. in tune with each other. And I think it's also because... She played such a big role in, in helping me develop everything. Yeah. Um, and I just, we've worked together so well for so many years already that 
I don't know. It just we just click, and yeah. and she's she's one of my closest friends in the world. We understand each other really well. Um, so it's it's always good fun investigating with her. But she's really good at what she does. Very very mm-hmm. good. Yeah, sounds very interesting person. We'll have to have her on the show, Mark. <laughs> yes, I we will. <laughs> definitely think you should. She is. She's. You know what? What gets me the most about Liz is that she used to be yeah. a CSI. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So she comes from a forensic science background. Yep. Mm. Very analytical. So, you know. Yeah. Really. So when when we do an investigation, she is one of the first people to debunk things, um, and it's great because everyone's like, "Oh, isn't she the medium?" Like. <laughs> Why is she debunking? You know, she just be, <laughs> it's it's funny because we get ready for an investigation, and I love my equipment. I really do. Um, I do rely on it quite a bit to validate whatever it is we are both picking up. I like all the bells and whistles. I like yeah gadgets. You know, yeah, they. I find them. Yeah, so you're nice like me. Too. I I love gadgets. I, I absolutely love them. do. So I rock up there and I'm like, I'm going to have these different types of recorders. I'm going to have these different cameras. I'm going to have, you know, these different mal meters and EMF detectors and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And she rocks up with a torch. Yeah, but you don't really need it. To tell you the (laughs) truth, now I'm a medium and ex-trans medium. I've given it up. I've retired now. But, and I come from a background as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. As a medium, really, she's right. You only need yourself. You're the best tool you can have. You really are. I mean, even for people that are only slightly sensitive to something. That's um, right. You know, the human body is amazing. It really is. And and you can pick up so much more if you just pay attention. Well, well, this is it. It's a gut instinct for a start. Now, how many mothers or normal housewives... They get that, they're in there washing up at the sink and they get that feeling that there's something wrong with their child out playing. Mm-hmm. They know. They know. It's yeah, there. exactly. Everybody's got it. Completely. Everybody's really. got it. It's just knowing how to use it. Exactly. So, you know, I've had so many discussions with people where they get really upset if you call it your gift or your ability. And I say to people, you know, it doesn't matter what you call it. Everybody has it. Everybody has it. It's like a muscle. If you don't exercise it and you don't learn, you're not going to open up to it more. You're not going to be more sensitive to it. If you're scared of it and you're shutting it out, well, guess what? It's not going to develop. Well, it goes back to the early man, doesn't it, Mark? Let's face it. It does. And we all, uh, you know, again, getting into almost a totally different topic is the fact that you know, I think oh, ancient man was much more in tune with these abilities than modern man because we have so much programmed out of it, whether through dogma, religion, uh, government, society, uh, tradition, and folklore. And uh, yet this is a part of all human development. We all have it to a mm-hmm. certain extent, but yet you don't learn about this in school. You, you know, yeah. y- you get poo-pooed or you get told by your parents, oh, that's your imagination. And I used to hear my name being called at times when I was a kid. And I go to my mother and I go, were you calling me? No. And I go, well, I thought I heard a voice call me. Oh, it's your imagination. How many times? Yeah. And kids get beat out of them or you dismiss it. You'll hear something and automatically dismiss it and not even give it a second thought when it's part of your, your own natural abilities picking up on things. Yeah, very true. And it's the same as like children with their imaginary friends and things. Yeah, and you shouldn't poo poo them. You never know. Yeah, you need to ask questions of that. It's very yeah. interesting what, what kids are, because they have no filter. They don't know any better. They haven't been conditioned otherwise. So when you have a really young child and they start coming out with really strange things like that, asking them questions, it's amazing what you can learn. Oh, yeah. I mean, not only between kids seeing. Um, their imaginary friends who sometimes are older people, not the other kids, mm-hmm. sometimes kids, sometimes it's not. Uh, or when a kid starts telling you about, yeah, you know, my other mom and dad. Yeah. Oh, I had <laughs> that. Past- Actually, um, a friend of mine has a twin boy and girl. And the little girl came running up to me and she came and jumped on my lap. And she looked at me and she goes, you know, when I used to be big. And I was like, wait, what? Oh, 
tell me more. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And it was really interesting, you know, the things that she would come out with. And her mom would just brush it off. I'm like, no, 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 you need to ask questions. Um, I had, I never used to believe in past lives. And as a child, I actually had a situation that happened. um, And I spoke about this recently on a show, actually, where I, my dad gave me an old wooden cigar box. And he told me, because I was a really crafty kid, he used to make stuff out of junk. And he was like, oh, you can make something out of it. And a few weeks went by and my mom was like, what did you make? And I was like, oh, it's my magic box. You can't see it. And my mom, being my mom, was like, well, what do you mean magic? Like card tricks and things? And I was like, no, don't be silly. Like magic. And she was like, well, what do you mean? I was like, oh, don't worry. It's, it's, my, it's mine. Don't worry about it. And so when I was in school, she went and dug it out of my room. And I got home and I was so angry because she violated my privacy, my room, my little sanctuary. Um, And she was like, she was shocked. She was like, well, where'd you learn how to do this? And when she opened it up, I'd set up a perfect Wiccan altar with the candles, with the pentacle drawn in it, with everything, little mini everything, perfect little altar in this box. And she was like, what do you do with this? And I was like, oh, you know, I go sit under the willow tree and I burn some herbs and things and I say stuff and yeah I I play I'm a kid I mean you know I'm just a child and she was very confused and concerned about the fact that I was actually practicing Wiccan things as a 10 year old kid that knew nothing about it Um, and it was only when I grew up and I understood more about it I was like (laughs) oh hey that was kind of (laughs) weird so you're not a Wiccan then I am actually. <laughs> you are a Wiccan. She is oh, now. She practiced yeah. it when she was a kid. She yeah. got it all perfected yeah. now. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My weird ways. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to have you on again just talking about that one subject. I'd love to. Mm. Yeah. Yes. What I was gonna <laughs> <laughs> There was a dramatic pause there. We were gonna like I... on bated breath. Yes. Uh... What I wanted to know was, right, you you investigate these historical buildings, MJ, mm-hmm. right? Tell us the best one and what it, what a, blah, blah, blah. here we go again. Uh, this is <laughs> because I'm suffering fatigue, people. Do bear with me. Uh, yes, please, please tell us which is the best one you've ever done. What was the haunting there? My favorite location in the world is the Explosion Museum down in Gosport, Hampshire. And yeah, I've heard it is that an, one. It's an mm. old naval base where they used to make all the explosives for World War One and II. Um, mm. They used to create the gunpowder there. So there were a lot of accidents and things that happened. Um, they used to supply gunpowder to Lord Nelson's fleet, including the HMS Victory. Mm-hmm. So it's it's got a lot of history. Um but it's been turned into a museum. So you have so many artifacts, just the the history is amazing. You know, there's so many different items with energy attached to it. Um, And then the location itself just has a lot going on. There's just layers. Um, And it's probably my favorite because every time we've investigated it, we had something happen that was so mind-blowing that we couldn't explain or debunk no matter how hard we tried. So it Mm -hmm. was never a a dull moment in that place. Um, And we've done it so many times. But unfortunately, I called them last week to book a few more events there, and they're no longer allowing any paranormal investigations. I was completely heartbroken. Um, I, I find that happens a lot anymore, that places that used to be open to it, now they're trying to get away from paranormal. Well, and... the only reason they're stopping is because they were, they've were they got one building that was falling apart, so they decided for health and safety reasons, when you went to investigate, they just went, okay, that one, that particular building's off limits. And I think it's when they started tearing everything down. They actually found two live ordinance on the property. Um, so, yeah, two live bombs, that's a pretty decent reason to to not allow people 
in that area anymore. Oh, come on. It adds to the thrill factor. I know, right? <laughs> You want to be scared? Here you go. Go investigate that building. <laughs> Two steps to the left, and we might need you to contact us through EVP. <laughs> like, do we have any what about hoses? historical houses and castles, something? Um, Warwick Castle is probably my favorite. I've I've done several castles. Oxford, Oxford Castle was interesting. It was very overwhelming as as a medium. However, on the equipment side, we got barely anything. Um, we were in there for hours and you, you didn't really capture much. So to me, that was like, yay, it's a medium's dream, but I like capturing hard evidence. Um, so it was, it was good. It was definitely an interesting location, but Warwick Castle, my goodness, that place is phenomenal. Um, I was actually there today. I went to go and have a meeting about the the convention in September because we were hosting it for three days at the castle. So um, I went to go and have a chat to them about that. And about this time last year, I captured a photo during the day while I was doing a bit of a walk around and looking at some of the rooms we were going to be investigating. So I was snapping some photos and I was alone in one particular room. And I took a photo of this little sign that was in, at the end of the bed. And it says the Kenilworth bedroom is the most haunted room in Warwick Castle, etc., etc. And as I'm sort of leaning down, trying to get a decent photo of the sign, I kept feeling really uncomfortable, like somebody kept walking up behind me. So I kept looking over my shoulder and looking around the room, just feeling very uneasy. So I snapped a few photos and I left. And when I got home, I was looking at the photos and in the reflection of the sign is a full-bodied apparition stood in the window behind me. Really? And, yeah, it's crystal clear, too. So I called the castle straight away, and I was like, do you, do you have any waxworks, any, any figures or anything in that particular room? And they're like, no. I went, okay. Is there any way that you could check your CCTV or, or anything, just, you know. And they were like, yeah, sure. I mean, you're alone in the room. What did you want to know? And I went, uh, I've got a photo to send you. And I sent them the photo and I said, please, please try your best to debunk and recreate this photo. Please. I want you to try everything possible. And they couldn't. Um, and I've been back twice now since then. And twice I've tried to recreate that. And I've not been able to. We've even tried putting somebody to stand in the exact position um, in case someone had walked into the room behind me, but <clears throat> on the CCTV and that it shows I'm alone. So I was in there again today trying to debunk that same photo, <laughs> which I took a year ago. Um, but just as a location, it's, it's amazing. Um, it's really active, very interesting, amazing history. We'll have so to get your uh, your take on that photo that Irene took uh, this weekend of the waterfall that we talked about earlier. <laughs> you know, when I was listening to that, I was thinking to myself that for some reason, the first thing that popped into my head was elemental. Mm hmm. And and that's something that we are investigating. We talked about it a little bit in the beginning of the show that a lot of whatever it is, these caves and and mines and tunnels seem to have a type of activity that I I don't classify as hauntings anymore. Mm -mm. Um, uh, we we did an investigation here in Colorado back in January of these caves, these caverns that are open to the public. And mm -hmm. we went in after, after they had closed one night and investigated, and we got a bunch of activity, and there's really no records of people dying in there. Um, and the caves go back, you know, almost like a million years old. So what sort of activity were you experiencing there? Uh, unexplained voices, footsteps. Uh, we got, we got several EVPs. A couple of them were like growls and others were class A, one telling us to get out. Uh, wow. and, and yet they're again, not, 
not any evidence and no historical record of anybody dying. And this was in a part way deep in the back where nobody really went. And the Native, the Native American people in this area didn't go in there because it was known as Cave of the Winds. There's the wind goes through, the air goes through the caves and causes breezes and sometimes can make noises. And they looked mm-hmm. at it as sacred and didn't really go in there. So no bones, no pottery, no nothing. And, and back where we were in that part of the cave, no animals, no insects, nothing. 200 feet underground. Uh, wow. And yet we were still catching this activity. And this is something Irene and I have been talking about for several months now and looking into is this idea of you mentioned mm-hmm. elementals. And that falls in line with other researchers like Barry Fitzgerald, who looks into the Celtic mm-hmm. fairy lore and the Shea. Um you know, there's Icelandic elves, Middle Eastern jinn, and these types of entities, whether they are spiritual or maybe interdimensional, some kind, you mentioned elemental, mm-hmm. we don't know what they are, really. And I think that it has, that could be a possible explanation for a lot of so called hauntings in I locations. I completely agree. Um, we, we had a case in New Jersey that I worked on for several years off and on that I'm convinced is that type of an elemental case, uh, something attached to the land. Um, Mm -hmm. So, and and that brings another question to me in in some of these places you've investigated. Has your, you've been investigating for seven or eight years now. Have you had anything happen that really changes your mind on what you're dealing with? Anything that caused a paradigm shift for you? Yes. (laughs) Um, Sorry. I was, we were, we were at the spirit house in Evesham and it's a really small location. It's tiny. Um, while we were in there investigating, we had the spirit box on, but we weren't really getting much activity. There was probably five of us there. And, um, so we had the spirit box on and the recorders and everything. And we were just having a chat, having this conversation and we had this little girl's voice come through and say, help me. And it sounded like a really young little girl. And um, so I acknowledged it. I was like, oh, <clears throat> that said, help me. But when I tuned into it, it wasn't a little girl. It was the first time I'd come across something that was Trickster. mimicking a child. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a trickster. Yeah. Oh. It's, it felt very elemental. It didn't feel like it was a human spirit at all, um, which is really weird to explain. It kind of felt almost animal, but not quite. It's the, probably the best way I could explain it. Yeah, I, I've come up against them many, many times, and they will mimic children. They will so, make well, children because this, they want to get that sympathy from you. Exactly. So hmm. this was the kind of feeling that I got was whatever this was, was trying to tug at your heartstrings. So mm-hmm. you go, oh, it's just a little child. And you start interacting. And that's where it started getting a bit strange. Because the moment I picked up that, wait, hold on, this doesn't feel like a child to me. This, I'm not picking up a child. I'm picking up something messing with us. So I said to everyone, just ignore it do not interact with it. So we had the first, like, help me come through, really crystal clear. And then about 15 minutes later, we had um, a second voice come through, which was a little bit lower, saying, help me. This sounded like a a woman's voice. So I was like, oh, that's strange. The voice has changed. And then about another 10 minutes later, it happened again. But it was this really horrible yeah, I, rough, I knew you were gonna say nasty that. voice that went help me and i was just like oh my god that is really creepy can't be dealing with that um <laughs> well, so that you either get time. you either get that that really raspy growly voice or otherwise you get a growl it's yeah uh, so um, actually at explosion museum we had helped me come through on evp crystal clear a couple of times and then we had these growls, but they were audible. You, they weren't EVP. We actually heard this growling moving around around us. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and we tried everything to debunk it. And um, we also, during that particular time, we captured an EVP saying, can we use them? Uh-oh. <laughs> Which, if I had heard that at the time, if I was live listening, I would have made another tunnel out of that place. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what you're doing is you're bringing up a very important point, and that is we talked earlier about doing investigations and not only using your own abilities and mm -hmm. and and senses that everybody has and learning to tune into that, but also using the equipment. And, you know, yeah. sometimes I think there's too many gadgets out there that all basically do the same thing. And, do the same thing. And you yeah. need to whittle down what you want to have in your equipment case. But this is where they both come in handy. So you, when you hear a voice, you cannot uh, jump to conclusions. You cannot yeah. think, oh, a little girl. Oh, a little girl who maybe who died here. No. Yeah, but people do, Mark. This but that's what I'm yeah. saying. Things this is... know how to... They know how to manipulate you. But that's my point. Oh, they know Gosh, what pushes yeah. your buttons, and children always pushes the buttons. Right. Well, and and this... that's why we as investigators can't jump yeah. to conclusions when you hear something. We used to need to use all of our tools, including our own six senses, mm -hmm. to find out what's true and work to narrow all that down. And I'm sorry, MJ, yeah. go, you were going to say but something. They're, go ahead. They're, they're, hoping to, they're hoping that you're going to be these uh, I'm the best, I've been at it two mm -hmm. years group. Well, even even people, and they're are, the ones that go home with all the problems. L let me yep. use, let me say this as an example, and then MJ, I, I, I want you to continue. But like uh, we talked with Tony and Deborah Pickman, um, who with, from the famous Sally House haunting, and Deborah in her story tells about the fact you know they both saw this little girl spirit they called Sally. Turns out later it was demonic, and they had problems that lasted for years. But Deborah got sucked in by the little girl and she just wanted to help it she wanted to mother it and she was mm -hmm. giving it this attention and giving this attention and yet it was turning around and scratching tony there in front of a film crew he got scratched across his stomach you watch wow. the welts form um and it got so bad after a couple of years they finally had to leave he was under demonic oppression almost possession and it, it really affected them. And she was in denial because it had its own hold on her because she was convincing herself it was this little girl who needed help. Mm -hmm. uh, so See, now, in my case, when that all happened, like, I, I, I apologize to all mothers in advance. I really can't stand children. <laughs> <laughs> you do I glad you want in my house this weekend. I <laughs> I'm a child person as you can possibly get. <laughs> I, there is no like, ah, none of it. Like, I can you imagine? Can you imagine if I brought her to my house this weekend, Mark? Those kids would have been sitting. Not, on, they would have been sitting like little soldiers, sitting no, there honestly, not moving. There is not a <laughs> maternal bone in my body. Um, and everyone always went, ah, oh, the older you get, well, the older I get, the worse it got. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the moment I'm on an investigation and I hear a little child go, help me, I'm like, oh, creepy dead kid, nope. <laughs> <laughs> there is no part of me that goes, oh, let's help it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, wait, you got to throw out there, too. It's like, okay, a spirit of a little kid and it's pulling at your heartstrings. Well, you know what? I'm sorry to say this. This is going to sound cold. It ain't a kid no more. You know, it's a spirit, yeah. whether it's one years old or 10,000 years old, it's still a spirit. And, yeah. you know, maybe mentally, if it's still stuck on the, this plane, you might have to treat it like a child in order to whether mm -hmm. to get it to cross or however. But, yeah, most times, and I personally think most kids when they cross, they're the, because look what we said earlier, how in tune they are to other lives and other things mm -hmm. before it gets programmed out of them. I think kids cross quicker than anybody else. And maybe yeah. it's these mimickers and these negative entities that take advantage of that. Yeah, no, I do agree with that. But like I say, you know, any any investigation, and Liz always laughs at me um, because we'll walk into a location. I go, oh crap! She's like, what? I'm like, child. <laughs> <laughs> and then I sit there and I'm like, is it a child? I'm gonna stick with it, and I'll investigate and I'll follow it around. And I'm like, yep, yep, that's a child. Yep, nope, not interested. Mm -mm. That damn little <laughs> bastards. <laughs> <laughs> um. But 
I think it's because of my experience where where it hasn't been a kid, and that terrified me really right. badly. No, I mean, I don't like kids at the best of times. So, so, so creepy entity pretending to be a child, just no. It's yeah. just all sorts of no. <laughs> I'm the same way. If I can be around my nephews and nieces, and they're all great, they behave themselves, but still, at the end of the day, I get to go home. <laughs> well, I'm different. I'm, I'm okay. I never was maternal until I got my two boys. Then I became overprotective maternal. And now I've got my grandchildren. That's it. You know, I've got my little ch- chicks or, or whatever you want to call them. And I'm quite happy now. Like I say, yeah. I love seeing them, but I love sending them home as well. Well, <laughs> here, here's, here's something else I'm going to throw out at you. And I like to ask our, our paranormal guests uh, these types of questions is Mm -hmm. when you're doing an investigation, have you come across something that just a type of phenomena that just has you stuck and you don't know, even know how to classify it. It's so out of the box. I've had one or two things where we've had random EMF spikes and things almost, almost as though the EMF was bouncing off walls if that makes any sense. We mm-hmm. did figure out that it was actually, there was a natural explanation for it. But what I found interesting was the way that it seemed to move. However, it basically, it was in this, in this corner of an old bar. Um, the way the walls were and the way the, all the fridges and things were positioned behind the bar, um, the EMF just spiked and, and sort of moved really randomly in this particular area, but there was no intelligent evidence. There was, I mean, there was no interaction. We didn't get anything else in that area. So whether or not that was actually a spirit, which I didn't pick up on anything and neither did Liz. It just seemed, it just seems like a really random EMF field that was moving about. And I, I've not come across that before. I don't know. Enough, again, as I say, about EMF and the possibilities of, of it moving in a certain direction or, or in a certain way or bouncing off the surrounding. I just found it interesting because I thought to myself, like, how many people have gone in there and investigated that and gone, oh, the EMF spikes are moving, it's definitely haunted, rather than looking at all the other possibilities. But with regards to coming across something that I not been able to explain well, yeah there's a lot of things i can't explain something that's really stumped me not really um well have you ever investigated um a location where they're reporting one type of phenomenon and then you start to think maybe it's another type of phenomenon uh we mentioned elementals before but uh you're... yeah i mean you know again in this particular place that i'm talking about where we had the random emf spikes um, there were reports of a lot of shadow figures and apparently quite a bit of activity and interaction and that sort of thing. But what we actually discovered was that it was more residual. Um, you know, that it was literally just trapped energy. It was not anything intelligent. It, but no, not so much. I've had places where they go, oh, there's no children here, or there's no this, or there's no that, and trust me, if there's a child, I will find it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, they are so drawn to me. I think it's the fact that I don't like yeah, them. I was going to say, they find you. Yeah. It's like if you're allergic to cats, and then all the cats flock yeah, to you. Yeah, all of a sudden, there's cats everywhere. Yeah, that's a, Do you know I actually am allergic to cats? And that does happen. <laughs> they always end up jumping all over me. But yeah, so same sort of thing. I mean, I have been in places where... We've picked up and documented stuff that they've never even known was there. They've never had reports of it before. They've never had anyone else capture any evidence that supports the same theory um, or whatever it is we've experienced. But nothing, nothing that I can really think of that really stands out. It, it just there's a, there's a couple of things that uh, we we've, we've talked about in past shows that just come to mind. Um, you mentioned residual, and sometimes. Residual could be the energy of a past event or or something mm-hmm. that's replaying, and then but you know some of the the research we're doing with Sari is looking into aspects of time, uh, time being much you know, more fluid 
and um, happening. It's not as not linear like we think it's it is. Not, yeah. So, are you dealing with are you dealing with a past event? Are you dealing with a time slip? Um, well, we, that's we've... just it. Is it is it residual oh, okay. energy with the same old? Oh, it's the stone tape theory that you know. Because I mean, if you look at some of the older buildings here, especially in the UK. Um, a lot of the, the walls and the stonework and that has high levels of the mineral silica in it. Um, and silica is what they use to make the old VHS tapes and things, the, mm-hmm. the magnetic strips. So that's what holds the recording. Um, well, one of the elements. So, you know, it's safe to say that if you have a high energy impact event in a particular location that that could very well record into the surrounding. And it could just be a, a replay of this particular event, just the trapped recording thereof. But how do we know that? Um, how do we know we're not actually seeing a time slip? Like you say, time isn't linear. I mean, what if you're just in the right place at the right time to witness that? What if it happens more than we realize? What if it's sort of a loop in time that you kind of get a glimpse of, I don't know, whatever's on the other side, but it's not necessarily a haunting. Well, and, and there's cases like the w- one case I mentioned earlier where, that we worked on for a few years. We found it was on the land because more than one house on the street were affected by it. But at the same time, there was a lot of evidence of it being just a haunting and then other weird things started to happen, and one of the one of the most interesting ones was the client um, got a hold of me one day, frantic, in one morning, because she said the night before, she woke up in bed, and in this area by her dresser, where when we did our investigation, we actually caught what looked like an apparition of a child's head or a small figure's head moving out of the way. Um, but standing by the dresser, she started seeing like this mist forming and it became mm-hmm. solid and she, she saw a white figure and then, you know, you start to think ghost and whatnot. And then it turned around and looked at her and she freaked. She goes, Mark, you're going to think I'm absolutely out of my mind crazy. And I'm afraid to tell you cause you're going to think I'm crazy. And I had to prompt her <laughs> to tell me. And she goes, Mark, it was a freaking alien. You know, Interesting. a gray, a, a gray type of alien with the big black eyes, bug eyes, tall, thin, and it turned and looked at her and she screamed and it vanished. But this was happening in a house in a location that had activity that would be more like um, what we would think of as ghostly or haunting. Mm-hmm. So again, so. Here's a question. So uh, earlier we spoke about elementals uh, projecting themselves as children. Kind of shape-shifting? Yeah, so children being one of my my big no-nos in life. Well, you know what? Uh, There's cross-culture phenomenon, uh, crossover phenomenon in a lot of cases. I I know Mm -hmm. a lot of ET people who've had ET experiences, UFO experiences, and they have a lot of paranormal experiences along with the ET stuff. The yeah, a lot uh, of cases we've worked on, there was a lot like that. Yep. Like it was UFOs, ETs, and one thing or another, and ghosts. Well, and I'll mention John Edmund down in Phoenix um, mm. with the Stardust Ranch. He's having a, a hell of a problem with what he calls these gray aliens. He sees UFOs, these aliens, but... It, Everything, even he's coming to this conclusion. We've interviewed him. We've talked to him. I might be able to go down there later this year and do some investigation. Oh, that'd be awesome. It, it seems like it may not be what it seems. Just like the, the, the child's voice, which you find out is not a child, these, these gray aliens may not be what they seem to be. Now, exactly. I, I'm, not on the, I'm not in the camp like some ufologists who've recently come out who I think are gone a little over the deep end that calls the aliens a demonic phenomenon. I don't buy that at all. But I do think that there is some of these elemental or whatever they are beings do have the ability to change how we perceive them. 
whether you want to call it shape shifting uh, mm-hmm. or or they're able to present a certain image in our mind, but they can be something else. And these things that he's dealing with are far more negative than any other ET encounters that I've heard from people. Well, here's another example. So um, I'm chlorophobic. I cannot stand anything to do with clowns. Um, it's Wait, you mean you fear. haven't watched Killer Clowns from Outer Space? Really? Hell no. <laughs> there is no t- they made a movie called Killer Clowns from Outer Space? Yes, in the 80s. It's a, yeah, camp, they did. It's a camp classic. And they took <laughs> themselves seriously, too. It was funny as hell. But anyway, continue. See, now, if I wasn't so chlorophobic to the extent that I am, I probably would watch that just for a laugh, but I wouldn't be laughing, so I'm not going to watch. I, yeah, I just can't watch anything to do with clowns. But we were on an investigation, yet again at the Spirit House, and there was something in there that presented itself to me as a clown. Uh Uh-huh. I freaked the hell out. I was like, oh, no, no. No, no. First kids, now clowns? Hell no. So I think whatever was there was playing on my fears or what I really don't like. And unfortunately, those two things are clowns and kids. So what is that? I think they, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, I, I was just going to say, I think whatever was there, when you talk about shape shifting and that, I think it presents itself to you the way it's going to get more of a reaction from you. I was just going to mention, uh, in the Harry Potter series, J.K. Rowling had this one creature, uh, and I now I can't remember the name of it. Oh, uh, God, that, those things that floated around. Well, not, the, not, uh, not the Dementors. No, there was the uh, other one that um, when they op- he had the teacher would open the closet, and the, whatever this thing was knew what scared you and would come yeah. out as the form that most scared you. And I think a lot of these type of lower level entities or maybe even some of these elementals are able to do that. They they shape shift. You see clowns, you see children, you see, mm-hmm. you know, dragons, right. you see some spiders, something that is your fear. And they play on that fear because a lot of them feed off of that energy. And the more exactly. fri- the more frightened they make you or stressed or anxious, negative entity energy then that's what they feed off of them. So that's mm-hmm. how they, they get most most effective. I completely agree with that. I definitely think that is one of the cases. And maybe that is, you know, the case for some of the, like you say, some people seeing greys and things in their houses and and having these ET experiences. Perhaps sometimes it's not always what it seems. Perhaps it is something like an elemental playing on your fear. Well, there are two types uh, of other entity or types of creature, whether you want to call it, in the paranormal world, there's two new phenomenon that's being reported constantly. You have the uh, the Slender Man, okay? Yeah, which, you, you know what the Slender Man was. Yeah, the Slender Man was a fake, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was, ma- it was a made-up story that went viral, and now people see the Slender Man everywhere. Well... You know, is but it... you know that that yeah. brings it down to the Philip experiment that was conducted, um, where they they created um, a story surrounding a spirit of a gentleman by the name of Philip. They gave him a backstory. They made up the story of how he died. They everything was completely fabricated, um, and then they decided to see if that if they could make contact with Philip. And they were able to actually document some really strange phenomena all surrounding Philip, who was completely a made-up entity. So is it something so this, interpreting so it? Is this, could it be something interpreting it? Yeah, Mark. Or could it be that everybody expects to see it? So it's going on the same line as a tulpa. People are actually creating it with their own minds. Mm-hmm. Like a, a Tibetan yeah. thought form. Yep, yeah, exactly. Like t- tulpa, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So here's so, another thing that an, another experiment that we've recently done um, on an investigation in March. Um, we were at Fort Horsted and we were there with Brian Keno. Um, and it was probably a group of about 18 of us there, thereabout, that had the fort for the evening. 
And the whole point of the the investigation was to learn new experiments and new techniques from somebody that's been in this field for quite some time, you know, that's a well-respected investigator, really pick his brain. Um, and one of the experiments that, that Brian brought up, which I found really intriguing, was a psychic projection experiment. So we all sat around this massive big boardroom table in the base area, um, the entire group, everybody had their recorders, and we'd been talking about Lord of the Rings that day. So when it came time to do this experiment, Brian said to us, choose a word with two syllables that any word, it can be anything that we agree on. And so because we were talking about Lord of the Rings, the word of the day was Gollum. And so we all hit our recorders. Brian had his. And he said, there's going to be no tagging. So if you do shuffle or anything like that, don't don't tag it. We're going to record for 60 seconds. And we want everybody in the room and around the table to focus on the word Gollum. That's it. Focus it as hard as you can. Concentrate as hard as you can on this word. And so we did for, for 60 seconds. That's all we did. We sat in complete silence. We then played the recording back straight away. And you hear the word Gollum three times in a minute on the recording. Now, is that a psychic projection of our thought? Is that is that our thought that we're projecting into this recorder? Because thoughts are energy. So if, if an EVP is a spirit's voice and that's energy, why can't we do the same thing? But then it begs the question, how many EVPs have you captured are actually your own thoughts that you're projecting because you want that answer so badly? That is an excellent point. And at this time, we had five really strong psychic mediums around the table all really focusing on this word, really projecting the thought, along with another 13 other people in the room. So it's no wonder that we were able to successfully have this recording saying Gollum three times within a minute. Um, and Brian has actually done this experiment on several occasions, and, well, quite often actually, and he said that I think it's like five or six times that it's been successful. But is it because there's a high concentration of mediums? According to Brian, some of the other times that it was successful, there were three or four mediums involved. Um, so is it because it, it's mediums that are used to working with energy and, and focusing thoughts and things and receiving information or projecting information telepathically? Or is it just a high concentration of people in the room that it's a focused intent. So yeah, how many times that you, you've captured EVPs where you ask a question, like, how old are you? And in your head, you're going, he's 40. I bet he's 40. He's probably 40. I'd say around 40. And then you hear the recording and it's like, 40. And you're like, oh my God, he's 40. Uh, but then why is that word 40 bouncing around in your head? Is that your thought or are you picking up on somebody else's? Exactly. You know, you could very well be picking up on on a spirit that's there. But this is the question. I mean, the word Gollum, it's not it's not like you're gonna have a spirit standing next to you going, Hey, Gollum, Gollum, Gollum <laughs> You know, well, hey, you might. But it was just a really interesting experiment and definitely definitely food for thought. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's one we can try, Mark. Try it's to get to the really bottom of that one. It's a really experiment. Yeah. Um, I mean, back in, in, oh gosh, I can't even remember when it was, the uh, the skull experiment, when oh, yes. as part, part of the skull experiment, yeah, they we, had... We, in we interviewed, uh, oh, what's, sorry, I've forgotten his name. Yeah, one, one of the investigators for the skull experiment the, we had the on the show. One. Oh, Okay. Wow, that's um, really, I'd love to yeah, listen we, to that. We, yeah, it's on their Podbean. Okay. It's been archived on there. Well, we'll send it to you. We'll send it to you. That would uh, be great. I'd love that. I've got. I still got him. Hang on, I'm just checking on. He's still on my uh, Skype list here. Amongst <laughs> all the other hundreds. 
So, uh, you know, during the during the skull experiment, I believe it was the skull experiment that they tried it, where um, they actually had an old camera film and they locked it in a box and they had a psychic medium project whatever impressions, whatever psychic impressions that they were receiving onto this film by focusing all the intent and all the energy onto this film. They then had it in a, a secure... You know, they, they had their um, security measures and things in place and controls. And they had this film taken and developed. And it actually had images of people that had long passed away, as well as writing, which looked, and, and according to the medium, were um, parts and, and scribbles from the Akashic records. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so, we spoke about that all in the show. Robin Foy. That's who we interviewed, Robin Foy. Oh, I'd love to listen to yes. that. So, yeah. again, you know, that's actual images that have been projected, which I'd love to try that myself. Um, and we've we've done several different experiments, you know, that have been done in the past, but we've kind of put our own twist on them as well. Um, one that we really enjoy doing is, is the Singapore experiment, and recreating things um, to get a reaction, which has been very successful. Yeah, do you want to explain that to the um, to the listeners, MJ, just so for the ones that um, don't know about the Singapore experiment? So one of the main experiments that was conducted using recreations, um, it's a theory that suggests that if you can recreate anything from sounds to smells to whatever the case may be, um, almost like a trigger object. So having trigger objects and things, so being able to recreate. So um, Gettysburg, they do a lot of the the Battle of Gettysburg, the reenactors. The reenactors, yes. Yes. So that's very similar to, that is basically what you would call a, the Singapore experiment. It's along the same lines of recreating things. Um, we did it at... Oh, I've gone blank. Fort Woodley. That was it. Um, Fort Woodley down in Kent was really interesting. Or was it Hampshire? I've gone blank. It's Hampshire. Sorry. Um, there is, when you walk down one of the tunnels into the fort, at the end of the tunnel, you come to a spiral staircase that goes all the way up to the parade grounds above the fort. And there's four other tunnels that lead off. So we had people stationed at each entrance of those tunnels with recorders, um, as well as EMF detectors, etc. And we had the wonderful Ashley Nib. He's a great investigator, fantastic researcher. Um, yeah, we, had we know him. Ashley. Yeah, I, I, you <laughs> know, yeah, I love Ashley to bits. He's, he's really mm. amazing. Very, very interesting person. Great theories. Um, but we had Ashley walking around, around the spiral staircase and sort of the circle, barking out orders um, as though he was shouting to the soldiers that would have been placed at that fort. And we also downloaded the air raid siren. So we were playing that really loud and it was echoing through the entire fort. You had this this chaos from the air raid thing going off, you know, the siren, you had Ashley shouting orders, you had just what seemed really chaotic. Um, all of us were recording at the time, and it was only captured on one recorder out of the five that we had. There's a point where Ashley decided to pick a random name, whatever popped in his head, and he picked the name Smith or Smithy. So he was walking around going, well, hurry up, Smithy, you're lagging behind, son. And then you hear this deep male voice go, I'm behind you. <laughs> um, and it was only captured on one recorder, which each recorder is approximately about two to three meters apart. So and the the volume that this voice came through if it was actually anyone else that was there that had said this, A, it didn't match anyone else's voice in the location. B, 
it was said at such a volume, like the way the EVP came through, that if it was one of us, you would have heard it on any of the other recorders. Some of them were really sensitive. So it would have been picked up. You would have been able to, even if it was faintly heard in the background, you would still have heard it. Yet none of the other recorders had any sign of it whatsoever. So that was, it was really interesting recreating something and then you know, having a reaction to that, picking the name, creating the chaos. It's definitely something I recommend trying to do. It makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? Oh, it definitely does. Mm. You know, from the normal sitting there, just getting taken photographs and getting EVPs to actually no. put it into an experiment. We do try several mm. experiments. Uh, we do loads of different experiments using several spirit boxes, um, different cameras, different lighting, um, different audio recorders. There's there's so many different experiments you can try. And it's, it's such a shame because so many people are so stuck on, okay, now we're going to do EVP. Okay, now <laughs> we're going to try this. Okay, now we're going to... If there's anyone here, could you make a knock? You're in an 800-year-old building. That was me, by the way. I was going to say, <laughs> wow, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> For our listeners, that's me. That's me messing around. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I, I, that's again, that's something that's very important is mixing things up, trying new experiments, going in and doing the same darn thing over and over and over again. This is mm -hmm. it. How, this is how we learn. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And learn new theories and, and come up with new ideas on what we're dealing with and expanding our awareness of our world mm -hmm. around us, which I think is a hell of a lot more strange than we realize. Yep. You know, and again, it boils down to being willing to work with other people, putting those egos aside, because you might have 20 years experience and someone might have six months experience and they come on an investigation with you and you're doing your thing the same way you do it and what you're used to. And this person that's been in this industry for like six months, who's still fresh and doesn't understand anything, will ask you one simple question. Well, why do you do it like that? Why don't you do this? And you go, do you know what? In 20 years, I've never thought of doing it that way. That's a brilliant idea. That's the way Let's we've try. always done it, is you know, what, what so, a lot of people say. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is how I learned on Ghost Hunters. Exactly. You're most haunted. Exactly. I, I learned how to scream from a vet on Most Haunted. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, so, so put aside the egos and... Listen to other people's opinions because you'd be surprised what you can learn. That's true. When uh, yeah. when I was over in Salem last last month, um, I was speaking to Dave Giuliano, who. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, I, um, yeah. I know Dave okay. very well. Yeah. You do? Oh yes. Uh, do I really like Dave? I really really like him. We had a work for him sometimes. Very interesting. I did. Sorry. I said work for him sometime. I did. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, yeah, forget that one. Yeah, anyway, continue yeah, your story. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Dave and I were having a conversation um, about paracons and lectures and that sort of thing. And he was, he was asking me what sort of lecture I do. And I said to him, you know, I do a very basic Paranormal 101 lecture. The reason being is these days at conventions, everybody rushes out to be the expert in their field. And they forget about the, the people that have never been to a convention, the people that want to know more about investigating, and where do they start? How do they become an investigator? And trying to, trying to give more insight into don't watch the paranormal shows and put on a black T-shirt and get a cool little name for your team and decide to take on the entire afterlife without any experience, please. <laughs> you know, it's more, hey, guys, there are real dangers. There are real risks. Um, and starting with basic things. And so we got into a conversation about it, and I said to him, yeah, you know, it's just like, he was like, well, what do you add in the lecture? And I said, things like EVP. So before you start an EVP, what do you do? When you start an EVP session, what's the first thing you do? You, oh, you're you asking guys? us. Yeah, what do you I, thought you're, I thought that was a rhetorical question. 
<laughs> no, no, sorry. I was asking you guys. What do you do? Before starting an EVP session? Yeah, when you when you've yeah. started the EVP session, what's the first thing you do? Well, normally people ask questions. Um, I no, I check the place out first. Yeah, I mean, I well, I would say again, when is that EVP session coming into play? What have you done before yeah. you pulled out that recorder and started recording? And uh, you know, what are you feeling in the yeah, area too? Half the time, I don't do EVP sessions, Mark. I stick the recorders in locked off rooms and I just leave them because I can't be bothered to sit there going, "Is there anyone there?" No, I just no. don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I think... walk around, I'll scout the place out, walk around with a, a recorder working in my hand. Because if they're going to talk, they're going to talk. It doesn't matter whether you ask them to talk or not talk. You know, they, if they well, want you to know they're there, they're going to let you know. Here's a little thing that we do. So when you start an EVP session, most of the time you'll go, this is so-and-so and so-and-so in this room of this location on this day. <laughs> At this time? And, yeah, and you log... Wearing a pink blouse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the colour of my underwear today is... So, you know, everybody loves... Oh, I don't do that. Um, basically because it's just easier when you're going through your recordings to figure out where the hell that recording's from. If you're like me especially, mm. and you don't take stuff off the recorder often enough, <laughs> it's really helpful. But what I like to do is whoever's there participating in the EVP session is asking them to say their name out loud and then whisper it. So before you start, you go around the room and you go, MJ, MJ, because your yeah. voice sounds so different as a whisper. Mm. And so when you are reviewing your EVP and you do hear a whisper, you've got something to compare it to. You <laughs> now have the person saying their name out loud and in a whisper. So you can compare those voices to what you think might be a whisper and not an EVP. You can check the tone of the voice. You can, you can debunk a hell of a lot more just yeah. by doing that one little thing. MJ, MJ, we're out of time. <laughs> we are literally well out, out of, of time. time. <laughs> what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to bring you back because, uh, we want to know more what you're going to be doing in the future anyway. So. Sure. You ask me to talk paranormal, I will blabber on for hours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, and we're enjoying it too. Pe like, and when we bring you back, person. we're going to pick up from the, where we left off on this show, okay? With EVP <laughs> and we can also talk more EVP. about the Wiccan stuff too. But um, MJ, real quick, how can people find, uh, do you have your website or your Facebook page? How can people get in touch with you and, and see what you're up to? Um, the best thing to do on our Facebook, we actually have a group on Facebook called Sage Paranormal Events, Tours, and Products, and that's kind of all of our pages in one group. So you'll get a little bit of the conventions as well as the investigation side. Um, it's the easiest way to contact us. Or you can visit www.sageparanormal.co.uk. We've got a contact form in there and Welcome to get in touch. We love to hear from everyone. And that will also give them all the information on the upcoming convention, yeah? Uh, we have a separate convention website, but there is some information on there. If they mm -hmm. want to know about the convention, you can go to sageparacon.co.uk. All the info is there. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you for coming on. It's been a fantastic show. And you're not going to get away with not coming on again. You know that, don't you? <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> it would be an absolute pleasure. I'm I'm sorry to all the, the listeners, to to everyone that has to listen to me ramble on. For oh, so long. they love it. They love it. <laughs> uh, they it's will brilliant. It. We enjoyed it, so we know they'll enjoy I it. I really enjoyed it, too. Well, I just want to thank, uh, well, thank you for coming on, and thank you for all of our listeners for tuning in. We'll catch you next week for another edition of Paranormal UK here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Irene, have a great night. Uh, have a good you. night. Good night, everyone. Bye.